Spiritual Testing We should not be surprised when God allows unique tests to come into our lives to enable us to become more mature in our Christian experience. Let's take a look at Abraham because he faced one of the greatest tests that a man has ever faced. Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham. Didn't tempt him. Because God doesn't tempt us. Satan tempts. We, we get tempted because we're led astray by our own lusts, the Bible says. But God does test us. And God tested Abraham. And He said to him, Abraham, I like this little phrase here. Here I am. I, I think that this is more than just, I'm here, or I'm listening, or I hear you. I think Abraham has come a long way in his life. And when God speaks, he's saying, I'm here, I'm yours. I, here I am. And here's what God said. Shocking statement. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. <laughs> that's, that's underscoring something that, that really drives right to the depths of your soul, right? Take your son whom you love. And you can imagine how the love relationship between father and son grew even after Ishmael left the household. And, and Abraham began to understand what it really meant to have this son in his old age and the promise that God had fulfilled. Take your only son whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. And the land of Moriah, by, by the way, would be in Jerusalem. And it would be probably there on the mountain or the hill that he's going to go to is uh, right there in Jerusalem where there is an, uh, a Muslim mosque that's built right on that hill. And some believe it's actually the hill called Calvary where Christ was actually uh, crucified. But in this Old Testament scene, we see an incredible picture in some respects of the crucifixion. But we're not focusing here on the crucifixion. What we're focusing on is Abraham's son, not God's son, but Abraham's son. Take your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. And that seems so weird and so strange. In fact, later, once the law was given, God made it very clear that He never, ever approved of child sacrifice. And that's why right in the law, in Leviticus 18, verse 21, God said, you are not to make any of your children pass through the fire to Moloch as they were doing there in that Old Testament pagan culture where there were actual pagan kings and leaders and men who were offering their own children in order to atone for their sins. That was a part of their pagan culture. We know that was true in uh, certain Indian tribes, for example, that we've uncovered the remains in, in South America where child sacrifice was a part of their religious worship, trying to atone for their sins. And so this was not something unusual for Abraham. He understood that. It was done in the Mesopotamia culture, the culture from which he came. It was done there in, in uh, Canaan with the people around him. He knew this was happening. And so it was, it was not something unusual for Abraham. But it was not something that God approved of. But Abraham didn't know that because God told him to do it. And here we read in Leviticus, Do not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. That is a profane thing to do and an abomination to God. But Abraham didn't understand that. God is speaking and so he obeys. So the story continues to unfold. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and he arranged the wood. He's actually being obedient. And he bound his son Isaac, he placed him on the altar on top of the wood, and then Abraham reached out, took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord, and there, many times in the Old Testament when you see the as an adjective, 
the angel of the Lord, that is usually an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus Christ. I remember when Jesus was born, He didn't come into existence. He existed before time began. And so He would manifest Himself in various ways in the Old Testament. And I think it's interesting that here we see a manifestation, probably, of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And again he replied, Here I am. Here I am. And then he said, the angel of the Lord, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. And consequently, God stepped in. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you. He reiterates now the Abrahamic promise that he gave him even when he called him out of this pagan culture back there in Genesis chapter 12. I will indeed bless you. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. I will fulfill that promise. Your offspring will possess the gates of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. Who is that offspring, ultimately? Jesus Christ. Here is Jesus Christ, I think, talking to Abraham about Himself as the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God that would literally be slaughtered. The earth will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his young men and they got up and they went together to Beersheba and Abraham settled in Beersheba. It's interesting that we have a New Testament commentary that gives us insight into what Abraham was thinking as he was being obedient. And it's found in Hebrews in the great chapter on faith. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, this is the event now, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Did he offer up Isaac? No, but in God's sight he did. And notice what the Hebrew author says. He who had received the promises was offering up his unique son about whom it had been said, In Isaac your seed will be called. He knew, Abraham knew, that he was offering the Son through whom the whole world would be blessed. How could that happen if he took the life of his Son? What was in Abraham's mind? Here is the explanation from the Holy Spirit through the author of Hebrews. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Is that prophetic? Or is that prophetic? In Abraham's mind, by faith, he didn't understand it, but he said, God, if you take my son that you promised to me, that I would experience a blessing, a nation, and a seed that would bless the whole world, then you must have something else in mind. You'll bring him back from the dead to make this happen. So by faith, he proceeded. From which, we read, he also got him back as an illustration. And what is the illustration? Well, one of the illustrations that beautifully comes out of this is all of the prophetic aspects that relate to Jesus Christ, who was indeed crucified probably there on that same mountain, that same place where Abraham was to offer his only son. Because it was there that God gave his only son. But notice, as I say here, at the cross there was no turning back on God's part. No turning back. There was no ram caught in the thicket that could suddenly replace the Son of God. Jesus had to die. Without that sacrifice, no man could be saved, not even Abraham and Isaac. But coming back to the specific application, there's a test. 
Abraham was tested. And the Bible says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be tested. And so James wrote, centuries later, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, sisters, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And we need to understand that the joy here he's talking about is not some kind of elation that covers, takes over and we're jumping up and down with excitement and clapping our hands and, and just feeling all this elation. No. This is an incredible peace that God gives us in the midst of all this difficulty to know that we have joy unspeakable and full of glory that goes beyond humanness. In other words, it is a interesting blend of sadness and yet peace that God can give us in the midst of what we're experiencing. Paul talked about that in his own life. Even in the midst of his pain, there was joy. And that is something that, that's beyond our comprehension unless we experience that. And I've talked to people who've experienced that, even in the midst of incredible situations. The peace of God and the joy that they get in the midst of that trial. And so, James says, the testing of our faith produces endurance. It makes us stronger. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature. See, God is maturing Abraham as He matures all of us through tests. That you may be complete in your spiritual life, He's talking about here. Complete in your spiritual life and lacking nothing. God wants us to grow up so that we can become more and more mature in our spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus. So, uh, in what way has God tested you? And how has it helped you face difficult situations with greater faith and endurance? And we all have our own story. And sometimes we don't understand the events unless we look back. We see the panoramic view. Sometimes we're so much in the middle of it, we can't see ahead, we can't see to the side, we can't see behind us. And it's really difficult because we're sort of like Abraham, you've got to take, you got to walk by faith. Because you don't even know what's around the next turn, let alone what's going to happen around the next turn. And as I look back on my own life, I see some of that. But I really needed to grow mature in my Christian experience. If God was going to use me in the future, I needed to learn. And it was through a variety of things, an answer to prayer, an encouragement, that God once again helped me to get my eyes focused back on the Lord Jesus. And as I look back on that, I've learned a couple lessons. Number one is, if you put your eyes on people, they'll always fail you. Only Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I learned something else. And that is that because people fail you is no excuse to fail people. Because when you do, you'll disillusion people. See, God knows the future in all of our lives. And the unique thing about this is that He designs unique tests, I believe, for all of us that fits who we are, what our needs are, in order to prepare us for whatever God has in mind for us. And so if we can see these tests as opportunities to grow, it doesn't do away with the pain necessarily, but it sure gives a different perspective and in some cases the joy that we can have in the midst of the pain. And I remember that the first time that I saw any meaning in what was happening to me, there was a joy that filled my heart in the midst of my pain. It was like the clouds parted and the sun came through. And I hadn't seen the sun emotionally for months. And once that sun came through, the joy of the experience and realization of what God was doing in my life. And I didn't know and understand it all. Just like Abraham didn't, just like you don't, but God has a marvelous way of growing us up and maturing us.